Hi, I'm George and welcome back to part seven of the Horizon series. Now this week we're going to have a look at the launcher's air control box. Now it's primarily designed to be uh, remote controlled and it controls air flowing in and out of the rocket. Uh, so let's have a look at some of the details and how it's built. Here's the overall plumbing diagram with all the major components. We'll have a look at some of these in detail and so let's start off with the main valve that lets in air from the scuba tank. For the main control valve we originally bought a $20 3000 psi needle valve from eBay. The valve itself was well made but suffered from a design flaw that made it harder and harder to open and close as the pressure increased. The problem is that the stem under pressure acts as a piston and the only thing preventing it from being ejected is the thread. As the pressure increases, the more force is exerted on the thread, increasing friction and making it harder and harder to turn. The packing seal also significantly increases friction as it needs to be tight to seal against the high pressure. And lastly, because the seal for the needle is metal on metal, it needs to be tightened with a bit of force to stop it from leaking. At low pressures it was okay, but at the full 3000 psi, it was hard to open even by hand and we would have needed a much stronger motor to make it work. In the end, we just tossed it in the bin. So Dad went about designing our own valve that only required low torque to open at full pressure. It's a good thing that he spent most of his professional career designing valves. In a couple of days, he designed and then machined this valve. Here is a simplified cross section of it. The air inlet in this design comes from the bottom and goes to a small orifice. The orifice is held closed with this threaded seat. The seat itself is not directly connected to the stem like in the needle valve, but it has a slot cut in it much like a screw head, but with a much deeper slot. The stem itself has a flat section on it that fits inside the slot, much like the head of a screwdriver. This prevents any axial forces acting on the stem from transferring to the seat. When closed, the small orifice ensures that only a small force pushes on the seat, making it easy to turn. As soon as the stem turns, it rotates the seat, which in turn open the orifice, and the pressure equalizes on both sides of the seat, so there's no net force on the seat's thread. Just like in the needle valve, the air pressure tries to push out the stem, but the stem here has a narrow diameter to reduce its cross-sectional area, reducing the amount of force on it. It also has a tiny thrust bearing here, reducing the rotational friction even further, and an O-ring rather than packing provides the seal. All these considerations makes it very easy to open and close at full pressure. Next, let's have a look at the relief valve, which is designed to start leaking above a certain pressure. This prevents the launcher and rocket from overpressurizing if the main valve gets stuck open, for example. We've made this one from scratch to fit our specific requirements. Here, we're pressing a nylon seal into the seat. This is what the orifice seals against. Behind the seat is a spring, and behind it is an adjustment screw. The pressure above which it leaks is adjustable, and for this project we've set it to around 80 bar. Here we're connecting it to the high pressure port of a scuba regulator so that we can test it and set it to the right pressure. The booster manifold is basically an interconnect for several components and the hoses that go to the individual booster segments. It was machined from a solid bar of brass and a set of holes was drilled and tapped to fit the hoses and other components. The booster and sustainer pressure gauges have a range of up to 1500 psi. Here we're fitting it to one of the connectors that will hook up to the rest of the system. Then we apply some pressure from the scuba tank to check it for leaks and also to see how accurately it reads. And then we let the pressure out again. The non-return valve prevents water from flowing from the sustainer back into the booster segments. It consists of a brass main body with a stainless steel seat and small spring to help it stay closed. The spring is then held in place with this nut. Now let's have a look at the pressure release valves. These are designed to quickly depressurize the rocket should we need to abort a launch. We're just using these commercial units that can be fitted to scuba equipment and can handle 3000 psi. Here is the air outlet hole. 
Because we'll need to be able to control it manually as well as remotely with the motor, we need to make up a flange so that we can connect the stem to a lever. Here we're fitting the release valve to the sustainer manifold. Then the lever can just be put on. We'll talk about how these will be controlled in another video. So now it's time to put it all together. We spent some time arranging the components in different layouts to minimize the amount of plumbing needed. We had to make sure that all the hoses came in from the right directions. Next we started construction of one of the sides of the box that was going to house everything. The box is made from 18mm marine ply as we expect this box to get soaked during launch. We then marked out the location where the gauges were going to go and drilled some holes for the pipes to go through into the box. Because we needed to lay out all of the components in 3D space, we grabbed the kids Lego box and created a whole bunch of supports for the different components. Now this let us move things around easily as needed. To connect everything up we're using this thick walled copper tubing. We first cut it up into the various lengths we needed. We then heat treated them to make them softer which makes them easier to bend. We had machined a whole set of brass adapters that we soldered to the ends of the tubes. We repeated this process for all six tubes. Here we're fitting the softened tubes and shaping them to fit the rest of the components. This was pretty easy to do. And here are all the components fitted together in their final layout. Uh, this is where the gauges will be mounted. We then set about making the rest of the box. It needed a few more holes for where the hoses would go to the rocket and the scuba tank. The other two walls were then measured and cut to size. When this was done we removed the walls of the box so that we could assemble it all together. Here we're assembling the entire box with some wood screws. The bottom of the box is made from 7mm plywood. This was made from an offcut we already had on hand. And this was also screwed to the rest of the box. Then it was time to fit everything back in the box. This allowed us to cut out and fit some wooden blocks to support everything the same way the Lego did. When all the inner blocks were attached it was time to paint the whole thing with this waterproof paint. As I said before this box is going to get pretty wet during launch. When the paint dried, it was time to fit all the components back in. Here are all the individual components laid out. This is a time lapse of all the components going together.
and here's the final assembly. In an upcoming video, you'll see how all the components are secured inside the box with brackets and how the motors are attached and operated. Next, it was time to do a full pressure test and check it for leaks. The first problem was that we were missing a seal under the high pressure gauge. Now, once the seal was fitted, we found out that the gauge itself was faulty and so we had to swap it out for another. Then we found out we forgot an O-ring on the sustainer manifold, so we put that in. Next, we found out that there was no air going into the sustainer pressure gauge because solder had gotten into one of the tubes and blocked it, so we had to drill that out. Now both pressure gauges were working, but there was a small leak in one of the tube adapters where there wasn't enough solder, and so we had to resolder that. All in all, it took about an hour to get it all sealed up properly and working. Here we're doing a final test once everything was fixed. Okay, good. So that's it for this week. In upcoming videos, we're going to have a look how the motors are fitted and how they control the valves. Uh, but in next week's episode, we're going to start having a look at some pressure chambers. So here's a couple of test samples we've made and we've also pressure tested these. So more on that next week. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.